we're going to be. This past week, I had, uh, had the chance to catch up with a, with a man who I was his wrestling coach, and I was also his youth pastor, and today he and his wife serve uh, in Michigan at a church, and, and he told me, he said, I was, I was recently reading a book that you had recommended, um, and it was one that uh, I know that Pastor Mike had, had showed with me, and it was, it's called Awe, A-W-E, by Paul Tripp. He said, I, 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 was, I had already started, it was a couple chapters in, he said, and, and I just got to tell you about what happened this morning. He said, um, it was a chaotic morning, and I had like 10 minutes before I had to rush out the door. And he said, I, um, I, I, I opened up the book, was just going to read a couple of pages, and he said, the very first statement I read when I opened up the chapter made everything around me stop. He said, I couldn't hear my kids. I couldn't hear the TV that they were watching. I couldn't pay attention to my, to my wife who was uh, in the kitchen. He said, it was one statement, and he said, I want to share it with you. And this is the statement that he said. Paul Tripp had written, God's grace is only attractive to sinners. God's grace is only attractive to sinners. And, and he said, when he, when he read that, he thought like, well, what is he talking, what what's this guy talking about? What do you mean God's grace is only attractive to, to sinners? And in that moment, he said, I, I felt a bit offended. I almost felt, felt almost slighted. Like, why would you assume God's grace wouldn't be attractive to me? Why only to sinners? And then he said in that moment, that he was hit with the realization that in his heart and in his mind, he had worked so hard for so long to do so good and to separate himself from those who had no interest in, in following the heart of God that he had actually in his mind and in his heart separated himself from sinners and no longer saw himself as a sinner and therefore, God's grace was not nearly as attractive to him as it should have been. Because what Paul Tripp said is true, that God's grace is only attractive to sinners. And for as long as we fail to see ourselves as sinners in need of grace, even today, we'll miss fully embracing and rejoicing in the glorious grace. Jesus hey, Have you ever considered and I'm sure that you have that some of the most righteous People in the world also sometimes Are the most unhappy Seemingly miserable some of them People in the world that doesn't make sense the most righteous people in the world why wouldn't they live lives of happiness and joy and yet it's it's because they're consistently looking at other people and and wondering like why don't you get what i've got <laughs> I, i've arrived i don't understand why the why the simplicity of the christian life continues to escape you why you haven't figured out the crucified life yet like i have And the reason that people like that appear to be unhappy to others is because when you don't see yourself as a sinner, you don't see your need for grace. So you don't rejoice in the grace that God is giving you in abundance. Oh, but when you, when you humbly see yourself in the sinful condition as fallen and, and broken and, and needing grace, Desperately, the redemption of God's grace in your life. In those moments, you turn to run with open arms to say, Jesus, take me back, only to realize that Jesus has been pursuing you with open arms the whole time. And as soon as you turn to him, he's already there. And what joy there comes when you know you're a sinner and you know the grace that Jesus so freely gives. And today, I, I hope to leave you with the thought, or I hope the thought consumes you until you and I recognize ourselves as sinners. We will never recognize Jesus as our Savior. He can be a Savior. He can be someone's Savior, you know, those people. 
But he's here for you to be your savior. And we're going to look at this exact scenario in Luke chapter number four. Look at verse number 16, if you would. Luke chapter number four and, and verse number 16. The he there, as we start off, is about Jesus. So Luke 4, 16 says, and he, or Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, now, pause. We're, we're not done reading. Just leave your Bibles open. But you got to understand the irony of what we just read. The word of God, Jesus, the word of God takes the word of God and he reads it in the temple of God. And he doesn't just choose any passage out of the Old Testament. It, he purposely turns to this passage in Isaiah because it is a messianic prophecy written thousands of years earlier pointing to the coming Messiah and Jesus unrolls the scroll and he reads it right here. I want to actually show you. You don't need to turn there. But I want to show you what Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2 actually say. It says this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. This is Isaiah telling the people about the Messiah. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and notice this next phrase, and the day of vengeance of our God. And I'll come back to that later, but don't forget that, the day of vengeance of our God, to, to, to comfort all who mourn. I read one author describe this passage of Isaiah 61 as the mission statement of the Messiah. This is why he came. He came to declare good news to the poor, to give sight to the blind, and to set free, to bring liberty to those who were captive in their bonds. And this is the passage that Jesus chooses to begin his earthly ministry by reading. I'm going to go back to Luke chapter 4. So join me back there again. Verse 18. I want to reread what we just read. This is the third time we're reading it. But this is the mission of the Messiah. Ready? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Period. Do you, do, you, do you see what, what's missing for just a moment from what we read in Isaiah? We'll come back to that. Because Jesus in verse 20 does this. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. So the Messiah is done reading the messianic prophecy of himself. He sits down, and everybody is like, what's he going to say? And Jesus makes one completely irrational statement. Verse 21. He began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled, has been fulfilled in your hearing. Huh? What are, what are, what? Yeah, yes, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. How is, that, how is that possible? The Messiah is coming to help the poor and the imprisoned and the blind and the oppressed. Not us. And it seems like it takes just a few moments in verse number 22. It seems like it takes just a few moments for the people to, to, to comprehend what Jesus is saying. And all of a sudden, they, they get upset. At, look at verse 22. It says, and, and all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? Like, it didn't take them long to begin to cast doubt at Jesus for his words. And you can imagine, it's almost like they're saying, who is this guy? Who does he, who does he think he is? 
And Jesus picks up on that. And we're not going to read the rest of the chapter, but if you have your Bible open, I'm going to refer to some verses, although I'm not going to read them, because I want, I want to tell you what happens throughout the rest of the chapter, and we're going to come back and talk just about verses 21 and 22. But in verse 23, Jesus says, I know what you're thinking. You heard what I did in Capernaum, and you're thinking, hey, if you're such the prophet, if you're the Messiah, do it here to the Jews, not to some Gentile land. Jesus is going to say in verses 24 through 27, he's going to speak right in that. He says, he's going to tell them the prophet has honor everywhere except in his own hometown. He's going to refer to two prophets. He's going to say, you know, when Elijah was alive, that there were many widows who lived in the land of Israel when Elijah was a prophet, but God only sent Elijah the prophet to one widow to miraculously bless her, and she was not an Israelite. And Elisha, you know, Elisha, when he was serving, there was a whole lot of lepers in the land of Israel, but there was only one leper that Elisha healed of his leprosy, and his name was Naaman, and he was a Syrian. He was not an Israelite as well. God works where there is faith, not where we want God to work in front of us. And like the people took that as a personal insult, which it was. They took that as a personal insult, and I think it was in verses 20 and 29. They're ready to throw Jesus off of a cliff. They're so incensed. The Messiah has just revealed himself as the Messiah, saying God is looking for faith, not just simply heritage. And they're so mad, they want to throw him off a cliff, but it's crazy. I think it's verse number 30 where it says that Jesus walks right through the midst of them. Guess where he goes? Back to Capernaum. That Gentile land. And if you don't know what a Gentile is, a Gentile is just anyone in the world who's not a Jew. Small pocket of Jews, everyone else in the world is a Gentile. Jesus walks out of the small land of Israel, or that, that small pocket of Jews, and he goes to Capernaum, which is a Gentile land, and he begins to do miracles there. And notice the difference. The Jews, when he's there, want to throw him off a cliff. The Gentiles in Capernaum, I think it's in verse number 42, it says, we don't want you to leave. Like, what a difference. And it never changed throughout Jesus' entire ministry. He was completely rejected by his own people. The Jews continuously pushed Jesus away because Jesus was not impressed by the fact that they were Jews. Jesus was looking for faith. In fact, you'll find two of the saddest verses in the Bible at the end of Matthew chapter number 13. It says this, and they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. If I could just take you back again to where, where we're going to spend our time today, until you and I recognize ourselves as sinners, we will never recognize jesus as our savior and we can see this clearly from the two statements that were made in verses 21 and 22 this is not the whole verse these are just simply the statements jesus said today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing and the response of the jews was is not this joseph's son because the jews failed to see themselves for who they truly were the poor the blind and the imprisoned the messiah was sent to save because they failed to see themselves for who they were they failed to see jesus for who he was because when jesus says today the scripture has been fulfilled he was pointing out that the messiah had appeared to those who were poor and were blind and were oppressed and imprisoned prison but the jews could not see themselves that way they saw themselves as rich and as healthy and as free because of their heritage as people of god it was everyone outside the jewish line that was poor and blind and in prison but jesus was speaking to them just like jesus is speaking to us question is do we see the true condition of our hearts today see that word poor 
the, the, the Messiah is sent to help. The word poor is more than just not rich. It actually defines the condition of someone who is a beggar. Someone who has nothing to offer. And here's the thing, church. Unless we see ourselves as spiritually poor, beggars with nothing to offer when it comes to righteousness, we will never see the righteousness that Jesus offers to us as something we need. Most of us that have money in our bank account aren't standing on the side of the road asking people for money because we, well, we think we have enough. When we used to visit downtown Chicago, we would regularly see panhandlers sitting on the side with a cup and, the, and, the, and a small little cardboard sign just asking for money. I've never sat on the sidewalk in Chicago asking for money, but people who don't have money, they regularly do. People who have money, they don't. And people who believe they have righteousness in their lives aren't begging for God to fill them with his righteousness because, well, we have enough when it comes to spiritual sight it's so easy to look at the people around us and think i'm better than they are and better than they are and we fail to actually see the perfect holiness this backdrop of god's absolute perfection and see that our sin is just splatted across the canvas of god's backdrop of holiness because we don't see this, we only see what's inside of us. We're like the publican and the Pharisee who Jesus spoke about that came to the temple to pray, and the publican comes and he beats his chest and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the Pharisee stands beside him and looks at him and then raises his eyes to heaven and says, God, I'm sure you're so glad that I'm not like he is. Let's talk about what I've done for you. The, the way that I fast and the way that I pray and the way that I tithe, even on my spices. Aren't you glad that I'm not like him? But Jesus says as these two men leave the temple, one leaves justified. Not the one who saw himself as righteous, but the one who saw his need for righteousness be given. And prisoners... Well, these Jews didn't see themselves as, as prisoners. They saw everybody else who was, who was in prison and oppressed because they weren't a part of this Jewish nation. Sometimes it's very easy for us to forget America is a wonderful nation, the best nation in the world, as we have been given religious liberty to assemble. But religious liberty does not equal spiritual freedom. There are going to be people who exercise their religious liberty all over the nation today who are going to walk out of those gatherings still bound in their sin. But they can't see that they're prisoners. What I find so interesting myself is that sometimes it's those who are physically poor who, who have no problem saying, yes, I need even when it comes to spiritual things. I, I know many of you used to work on bus routes here, here uh, at Mount Carmel and reaching the community. And I, for seven years, I was a bus captain in the city of East Chicago. It was so easy to get kids to come to church. You needed a piece of candy or a goldfish. Goldfish Sunday, what those buses would be packed full of kids. They get on those buses and we take them to church and do the best we could to share the gospel with them and try to tell them what Jesus had done for their life. And they're so used to saying, sure, I know I need something, that when they, we explain their need for salvation only comes through Jesus, it's easy to say, sure, I understand, I'm poor, I, I've always needed help. You know what never worked on the bus routes, though? Running them through the wealthy communities. A goldfish wasn't attractive to a kid who had everything. A kid living in a very nice, comfortable home, a sucker wasn't going to get him on a bus. Which also meant the ears were not open to hearing the, the truths of the gospel so often. 
They say that familiarity hides the fantastic. That most automobile accidents take place near your home. That most household accidents actually take place in your bathroom because you're not looking down to see the floor is wet because you're in a comfortable area. And you know the people who sometimes struggle the most to see their true condition are the ones familiar with God and the Bible. Think of who Jesus was speaking to and where Jesus was speaking he was in the synagogue speaking to very law-keeping, moral people who did not see themselves in need of him as their Messiah. And sometimes when you tell people who know the Bible just enough and they, they know God just enough that, that who they are and the good works that they are doing is not going to be enough for the day of judgment that you must have the righteousness of Christ, they can sometimes get pretty upset with you. But it's the 2 Corinthians 4, 4 teaches us that Satan clearly blinds. He blinds the minds of unbelievers. They cannot see the light of the glory of the, of the gospel, of the glory of Christ. Until we admit that we're sinners, we'll never see Jesus for the Savior he is. And Israel never got Jesus because they never got past themselves. And so Jesus turned to the Gentiles, the Gentiles who gladly received him because they freely admitted their failures. And can I just share with you one of the many reasons you don't want to miss who Jesus truly is. Some people will say he's a good prophet. He's a moral teacher. Yeah, I, Jesus is one of many gods, and they're comfortable enough to, to say that, but they will not recognize Jesus as the Son of God, as the only way to God. And refuse to admit that they have to go through Jesus alone but let me tell you why you don't want to miss who jesus truly is because remember that little portion that we we saw in isaiah to proclaim the year of the lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our god but when jesus picked up the scroll in luke number four he he said to proclaim the year of the lord's favor period why does why does Jesus not mention this day of God's vengeance as the coming Messiah? Because the first time Jesus came, he did not come to proclaim the vengeance of God on sinners. Instead, Jesus came to receive the vengeance of God for sinners. He's isn't that temple trying to help the people know I, it's good news that I'm here because I've come to bring great news to the poor I have riches of abundance for you because I will take your poverty upon me and I will take your blindness and your prison and the oppression upon me. And I, I will suffer the vengeance of the day of God upon myself. So you can have sight. So you can be free. So you can be rich. Ah. But you have to see yourself as a sinner. Before you can see Jesus as your Savior. You have to see yourself as poor before you understand the, the, the riches that he offers and see yourself as a prisoner before we can celebrate the freedom he is offering because there's a second time Jesus is going to come. That's when he comes to bring the day of vengeance for those who never turn to him as their savior. Because they refuse to see themselves as a sinner in need of grace. And so let me wrap this up by just simply mentioning the post-release ministry briefly. 
Because I'm not here to convince you that this is a place where God wants you to serve. But I want to give you a few thoughts to consider. Seeing the physical condition of the poor or the prisoner should remind us of our spiritual condition before we met Christ. See, we were both spiritually poor and spiritually imprisoned before Jesus came to us and rescued us. And now, as we see the poor and imprisoned, guess what we can do? We can bring the same freedom, the same news of the freedom that we have rejoiced in to others. And when I see the poor, when I see the imprisoned, I don't think, oh, I think, oh, that was me. When Jesus came to me, yeah, pastor, but they, they put themselves there because of bad choices in their life. <laughs> yeah. And I was a spiritual prisoner because of bad choices I made in my life. And Jesus came to me. Yeah, but pastor, they may not want my help. Right. Do we always respond with excitement when God steps in to work in our life? As we see the poor and the imprisoned, should be a mirror showing us that is our spiritual condition. And Jesus didn't walk away from us. He came directly to us. But also, by loving the poor or the prisoner, the unconditional love of God is witnessed by the world. You see, if I help someone, and through that help of pointing them to Jesus, they experience a, a changed life. Then praise to God that he continues to work grace in the lives of people. But if I somehow help someone and all they do is take my help and, and never say thanks and walk away and never change, then guess what? Guess what we get? We get to love someone the way God loves people. Because how many people have heard of the love of God and said, no thanks. But that doesn't stop God from continuing to pour out his love and his grace over and over and over. And last, by serving the poor or the prisoner, our hearts are reminded of all we have received in Jesus. See, serving the, the poor and the prisoner, it, yes, it provides an opportunity for the love and the forgiveness of Jesus to be on display to the person that we're serving, but also it is reminding our own hearts of the love and forgiveness we have received from Jesus. And so as we serve someone who maybe no one else is willing to serve, we are reminded he served me when no one else was willing or could save me if you weren't at the funeral on Thursday it was one amazing testimony after another I, I, I was describing the funeral to my wife who was out of town and I, I didn't know how to say which of those testimonies from from Doug starting it off to, to Kara and the, the children each sharing. And then Brandon Tester sharing uh, of his love for Nick. And then his, his brothers and then, and then a best friend. And then Pastor Andy got up. And it was just one amazing gospel presentation after another. But I do know there were two times I was sitting next to Pastor Micah. And I just leaned over and I said, that is first time was when Kara stood up and with incredible poise she read her husband's testimony how and each of the kids shared such I mean you get a glimpse into that family you're just overwhelmed But then his four brothers, Nick was from a family of nine, four brothers come up to the platform and one spoke on behalf of all of them. And I'll just condense his words, but basically said, you know, if this wasn't Nick's funeral, 
I know we'd be talking about this big event. And we, we would say this. You know what needs to happen in that case? Forgiveness. He said, you know, on behalf of Nick's family, we as his brothers ask you, although you could look at this situation and be angry, we ask you to offer forgiveness. Their brother is lying in a casket, tragically murdered. And these four men, shoulder to shoulder, are saying, what needs to happen here is forgiveness. You know how that's possible? There's only one way. If that family has experienced the forgiveness of God in such a real way that when it comes time to forgive someone else, there's no hesitation to offer freely what has been freely received. I was just, I was in awe of these men. I was in awe of every testimony that came up and everything continued to point back to the gospel It's very evident that is a family that understands what they have received and therefore freely give. Would you bow your heads with me? I would love for you to just take a moment and I really just, just, just I just want you to, to think three thoughts. Have you ever truly seen yourself as a sinner? If you've never, if you're here today and you've never seen yourself as a sinner, then I guarantee you've never seen Jesus as the Savior that he wants to be. We've got to admit that we don't have it all together. God's holy, you're a sinner. God is just, and you and I are guilty. But God is love, <laughs> and Jesus came in your place. And the question is, do, I, do you believe in your works of righteousness or in his? When you see yourself as a sinner, I promise you, you'll see the goodness of Jesus as a savior. And if there's been a time in your life if you've received Jesus as your savior, do, do you struggle with seeing yourself as a sinner still in need of grace today? Because if not, I promise you, you're going to struggle to offer grace to the people around you who need it most. But if we regularly remind ourselves that we, are, we need grace today, then as we receive it, we will freely release it. And I just ask, would you, would you pray and see if this post-release ministry is a place God might have you serve where you can show the love of Christ to, to others and get involved in the messiness of life like God got involved in our mess. He's such a good God. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, please don't leave without taking care of that. It's it's not hard to simply knowing that you're a sinner and recognizing your sin and recognizing that you need Jesus to live that perfect life. And he died that sacrificial death on the cross. And it's a matter of trusting what he has done alone for your salvation. Oh, and then may we continue to wake up day after day and rejoice in the goodness of of God, the glory of our God. Is there someone you need to forgive? Is there grace that needs to come out in your life to someone? It's been freely given to you. May it freely be given by you for the glory of our God.
Would you stand with me? And Aaron's going to lead us.